Okay. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, before we jump in, I wanted to mention that we are less than a week away from our 2021 virtual mentoring conference. If you haven't signed up already, you can do so with the link that I will enter into the chat box right now. And then uh, additionally, we are inviting mentors to attend the conference for free this year. Uh, the mentor promo option is also listed on the link that I'm gonna send in just a moment. Okay, um, so in the spirit of Mental Health Awareness Month, we will be covering the topic of mental health. If anyone has any questions uh, during the session, feel free to enter them in the chat box below. And without further delay, please welcome Mentor Washington's Executive Director, James Miles. Thanks, Vic. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We have a, a wonderful conversation with uh, our friend Larry Wright from Forefront. Uh, as Vic says, our conference is next week. So excited for that. A lot of great sessions. I hope you're able to attend. Once again, uh, those tickets are free. Uh, for for uh, accessibility purposes, I'm calling in from the unceded territories of the Coastal Salish, the Duwamish to be specific. I am a middle-aged, light-skinned black man. Behind me is a brown, brown wall. Uh, brown wall, I'm in Columbia Tower. Uh, a brown wall, and I'm wearing a gray-ish sweater with glasses and uh, a very cool hip look. Uh, so let's, let's, get, let's get it started. Uh, our guest today is Larry Wright. Uh, he, he's the ED of, of Forefront out of, out of UW. They do a lot of great work with suicide prevention. I'm so excited to have you here. So Larry, welcome. Great, well, yeah, thank you, James. And thank you uh, for having me. And thanks to all, the whole uh, Mentor Washington team. Glad to be here. Yeah. So let's start so, off with, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, for those attending, can you please put into the chat where you're, uh, where you're representing, where are you calling in from? Let us know a little bit about yourselves. Um, Larry, I have to mention this, start with a little bit of history. You are the former executive director of Mentor Washington. Is that correct? Yeah, way back when. Yeah, and you did Mentor National as well. Yeah, and I was the CEO of the national one for a little while. Yeah, yeah. What, what, can you tell us a little bit about that? Was, so uh, with Mentor Washington, it was probably from 2004 to maybe 2009. And then I was in DC with the national from 2009 till 12 or something like that. So it's been a while. It's been a while, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Time That's passes amazing. quickly. Yeah, and what got you into the field of, of youth development? What sparked your interest in that? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. So I, I did my PhD in sociology and I was, um, I studied nonprofit organizations. And so, you know, life is funny. I was um, on my way, I had a postdoc um, actually in Italy and I was on my way there. And uh, I stopped in back home in Seattle. My father one day said, I've got to go to uh, lunch with a, a friend as it turns out. Uh, he was going to be a loaned executive from Costco to uh, what was then called the Washington State Mentoring Partnership. And I said, you know, hey, I've got a couple months on my hand. Uh, why don't I, you know, do a little environmental scan? And we worked on it for a little while. And that actually turned into a five-year project. With the <laughs> and so nice. needless to say, my academic career ended right there. And I've really never gone back. But, you know, my, my whole... Um, my professional life has always been uh, trying to help people achieve their potential. And so that's, that's why I got into teaching and research in the first place. And um, so it's a really natural, easy step to go into youth mentoring. Um, and in a lot of ways, this next step into uh, suicide prevention is just part of that arc. It's, uh, you know, maybe the, the deeper end of the pool, so to speak. But, um, you know, as I'm sure every, a lot of people know, a lot of the young people that end up in mentoring relationships exhibit um, signs of depression and anxiety. And, and those can be precursors of um, you know, people that get to the point where they're thinking of taking their own lives. So yeah, that's, I've started in youth mentoring. My, um, in a lot of ways, my heart remains with that work. I think um, while you know, I'm focused on helping everyone achieve their potential, I think um, you know, I'm particularly interested in helping that with young people. So we do a couple of different programs. Uh, across the spectrum for folks, but um, young people really kind of represent the uh, key focus. Thanks. Did, did you have a yeah. mentor? Uh, who was your mentor? 
like that led you down this yeah. path. Yeah. Yeah. So I was really lucky. I've had a couple, um, both in, in the mentoring world. So Bob Craves, Bob was one of the founding executives of Costco and um, he had called, started the College Success Foundation. And Bob really kind of took me under his wing for years and years and uh, really helped me understand what I could be, um, but also uh, wasn't afraid of telling me what I couldn't be, <laughs> at least what he thought. You know, he gave me some really frank assessments. Yeah, like don't let your head get too big, kid. <laughs> you know, right. You're not there yet. <laughs> And, um, you know, Bob, Bob and I, Bob really developed into a good friend. Um, I don't know if anybody knows it, but he passed away a few years ago, but um, he was a force of nature. When I was at Mentor, I was also lucky enough, um, Vim Koiker, who was the former, he's just on the board, I still believe, but he was the former uh, chair of the board. Uh, he was the one that reached out and um, asked me to come out there. And uh, when I came out there, we just had a great relationship. He was... Um, you know, he's one of these people uh, out on the East Coast, boy, uh, that that board has a lot of people with deep, deep pockets. And it was really interesting to see somebody who, quite frankly, could do anything they want in their life. Right, you know, right. He said one point, I have more money than I could ever spend or my kids or grandkids could ever spend. And he said, you know, you very quickly realize that that's not that important, right? Mm -hmm. What is important is leaving a legacy. And he, that legacy for him was helping other people. And it was really genuine and it was, it was inspiring. It was, um, you know, a lot of us who do this work are driven by the heart in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, he was that combination of heart and head. To him, it was a problem that, you know, needed to be solved. And it was very much, you know, he's applying his kind of business acumen to how do you do this and so on. And so it was really um, both of those guys were great for me, but I've had I've had many. I mean, I've been I've been lucky, really lucky throughout my life to have family and friends and, and people along the way who were able and willing to reach out a hand. So, yeah, you know, I want to pay it back to the extent I can. Yeah, something that's so so key, and so many uh, young people that we serve don't have that. They don't have that person reaching out with a hand and and guiding yep. them, supporting. Yeah. Them. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's, you know, that's the thing about formal mentoring that I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate, because, look, there's probably no one, everybody wants somebody, right? Yeah. It's it, somebody to say, hey, you're special, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to help you. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way, right? I, I mean, it, and there's a, you know, I think we want to wait for that person to recognize our star is shining, right? But yeah. it, it doesn't always happen. I mean, I think that one of the challenges um, with a lot of young people are those that could really benefit are the ones that are in some ways kind of hidden, right? They, they might be, they're not the ones that are up out front. And, um, you know, I remember Gene Rhodes one time saying that, uh, you know, th there's model mentees in the sense that, hey, these are young people who it's really clear they have a lot of potential and you know they're they're super outgoing and everybody wants to mentor these young people right because mm -hmm. it's kind of a reflection on them and they're they're feeling the success together but for many it's just you know these are quiet young people maybe you know have some challenges whatever the case be, is and so I formal mentoring for me has always been um, just that kind of uh, you know formalized way to get everybody out there, reach mm -hmm. out, you know, go deep, not just kind of the surface of kids that are saying, hey, me, me, but, you know, giving everybody that chance through whatever their network is to um, find a caring adult in their lives. Yeah. In addition, hopefully, hopefully, you know, they already have a few, but it's right. it never step more. Exactly, exactly. So you're at, you're at Forefront now. Can you uh, show us a little about, tell us a little bit about that? I know you have some slides you'd like to share. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know what, I was going to do some slides, but I thought it's just, you know, it, it's probably more informal and give people the, the chance to ask some questions. So yeah. Forefront Suicide Prevention is what we call a center of excellence at UW, and that just means that it, it really emerges out of um, professors who do research and then try to take that research and apply it. And so uh, we're in the School of Social Work, and um, our focus is to change the trajectory of suicide, both in Washington State and nationally. And so we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, we work on legislation, so we've passed a, a number of key pieces of legislation, and um, we work at the community level with organizations across the state, and then we have our own um, training and technical assistance that we also provide 
to organizations, companies um, that what are called gatekeeper trainings, right? It's really identifying what are the signs of um, potentially somebody thinking about taking their own lives. What do they need to do about it? Um, you know, it's really empowering people to say, okay, if I see something, I know what to do. I, I always use the example of, you know, if we if we were at the beach and we saw a young person laying down turning purple, you know, somebody's going to run over there and give them CPR, right? There, there's not going to be a stigma. Boy, uh, you know, I don't want to embarrass this person, right? I mean, that's not going to happen. You know, right? But with young people, particularly young people that maybe be depressed, there is this idea that, well, boy, I don't know what to do, or I don't know what to say, or, you know, maybe they're just sullen and that's who they are. I don't want to invade their space. And so a lot of what we do is what, what I think of as um, an invitation, giving people an invitation to get involved, right? Lowering that barrier to say, it's okay to ask, you know, people aren't going to be offended by it. In fact, one of the things we know is people um, who are thinking of taking their own lives frequently want somebody just to ask. And, you know, that's one of the things we do is if you've never asked that question before, it does not roll off your lips, right? Just, hey, are you thinking about taking your own life? Hey, are you thinking about suicide? I mean, it just doesn't happen. So um, a lot of what we do is kind of build that up, the strength of people, you know, do role playing, um, follow up with it. But, you know, one of the fundamental questions we always get is, should I even ask, right? If I ask, am I gonna make it worse? And the, the answer is no, yeah, you should definitely ask. But the, the key really is um, asking somebody and then um, in assessing kind of where they are, it's, uh, you know, have you, have you made a plan? Have you done anything? And if people have made plans and they're thinking about this, you know, that's when you kind of move it up the food chain and typically call somebody in. And, you know, we're working actually right now on, uh, a lot of schools, for instance, don't quite know what to do. And what they end up doing is they call um, 911. And, you know, that in some ways makes it worse. There are certain populations, uh, you know, not just in our state, but all over the country where having the police show up is not a mental health uh, support. It can be seen as an additional crisis. Um, but also it's just, it's, um, you know, it's not the appropriate response um, or that brings a lot of attention, you know, it's, it's um, so we're working with folks to understand what it means. Actually, uh, you may have heard uh, legislation just passed in this last session that there's going to be a, a 988 hotline for mental mm -hmm. health. And so yeah. we're, working, we're working on what that will look like a, a much more kind of organized, um, thoughtful response rather than just kind of you know, moving it up to 911. So yeah, our work, you know, is, is really pretty broad. Our, our, um, our kind of marquee program is something called Forefront in Schools. And Forefront in Schools is um, a three year long program that schools enroll in. And it's really about comprehensive change. It's, it's really about um, not just everybody in that building, but everybody in that community seeing young people as ours and everybody taking responsibility for young people. I think that, um, you know, as I'm sure everybody here knows, in the, in the workplace, other duties as assigned can become, you know, that much of your job, right? And um, when you talk about mental health in, a, sc in a, bu a school building, it's usually not one person's. I mean, you might have a counselor, but, you know, there's nobody whose job description is uh, prevent suicide. You know, it's just somebody might refer somebody to something and so on. And so our approach is that it's everybody's responsibility. And what we do is um, we work with each school to develop um, a crisis plan, which is actually required by the state, that um, really is robust around what you do when people have these mental health problems and where do you go. And then we train up um, the administrators, the teachers, the students, the parents, the community-based organizations, all in identifying these things. And then ultimately we train trainers so that when we leave, this is something that's sustainable. And every year we hold a series of conferences and events. And you know, once you're in the family, you're always in the family because um, you know, people change in the schools and so on. And so um, you know, not wanting to give up those gains that have been made, we train people forever and, you know, provide them with updates. And uh, unfortunately, one of the biggest things that we're doing recently is what's called postvention. 
So after somebody has uh, taken their own life, what do you do? And as you can imagine, schools that haven't gone through this work and haven't thought about it, just find themselves in an absolute kind of scramble to say, well, oh my gosh, what do I do? Um, you know, for example, I had, I had a call, gosh, I don't know, about a month or six weeks ago from a school saying, um, you know, we, we had a suicide last night. Uh, we're about to bring everybody into, uh, you know, a, a meeting here to talk about it. And, um, you know, can you guys come in? And, and I was saying, sure, yeah, we can help. But, you know, one of the, one of the things is you shouldn't actually have everybody in a meeting uh, or in a room. I think Zoom's a little easier, but uh, certainly bringing people in into an auditorium. And the reason being, you can't see people. You don't know what the context is. Somebody may be at home by themselves and may be withdrawn anyways. And this information without, you know, without other people around, without support, may actually be problematic. And so, you know, these are small things, right? But these are things um, that uh, come from a lot of hard work that have been learned that these are the, you know, this is, these are the best practices of, of how to practice suicide prevention. So our work is really similar to a lot of other folks that are out there. There's a lot of suicide prevention programs um, and, you know, work, we, our goal is not to compete with anybody. I mean, we're complementary, and we want to support whatever effort. Our, our difference is that we, one, um, we're boots on the ground. So we don't, you know, we kind of think of ours as a, a boutique program in a sense. So if we're working with you, it's three years. I mean, and it's a lot, and, you know, you meet regularly with our coaches and so on and so forth. Um, so that's one element. But the other element, which is unique to our trainings is, um, we talk about removing um, access to the means of suicide. And so that's a really big component of this. Um, there, there's a couple things, you know, and not getting too much into it, but when you think about this window of um, when somebody may take their life, there's a couple things around it. One is uh, if somebody, it's called perceived burdensome, right? If somebody feels like they're a burden to other people, um, that's kind of a, a red zone, right? If they couple that with um, what's called thwarted belonging, I think this is really where mentoring comes in. Thwarted belonging mean I don't have my tribe, right? I'm, I'm, on, my, I'm on my own. Um, those people are trying to be here. I'm just making life worse for them. So those are kind of two, kind of a Venn diagram. When they, when they overlap, you've got yourself a challenge. Now you got a third one. If they have access to the means, and so for most people, that's the gun. You really can't talk about gun violence in, in the country without talking about suicide because it, it accounts for the majority of deaths by, by a firearm. And so if you, ha if you have those things, um, you know, that person's in a, in a really challenging position. And what we, our, our focus is on making sure that we can identify um, those folks and that everybody can think about it because you know the, the, the good news about this work is simply that if you can help people over that moment where all those three things aligned, they may never come back to it. Now, it doesn't mean that they're all of a sudden gonna you know, the next day feel fantastic, but it, it can be avoided. And it doesn't necessarily, there's a, I think there's kind of a myth that if somebody wants to take their own life, they're going to, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's just not the case at all because those things change. And I think especially for young people who have a tendency to, to be a little bit more extreme in their thinking, right? You're in a valley and you're always gonna be a valley. There's never gonna be another peak, you know? And I think as you get older, you realize, well, that's, that's actually kind of the road you travel, right? right. It's all right. peaks and valleys exactly. and you're, just, you're constantly doing that. Right. But when you're young, you may not recognize that, right? And so that's a little bit of, of you know, what we try to help um, adults and even young people understand that, look, you, know, you may be in this, this situation and you may feel this way, but you're not gonna feel this way necessarily forever. And just like in mentoring, look, um, a lot of people need uh, formal specific help, right? We're not suggesting that uh, a volunteer can all of a sudden um, you know, be a therapist because that, that's simply not the case. But, um, you know, we actually do train, um, 
we actually pass laws where, uh, you know, anybody in a uh, medical profession, if you're a dentist or if you're a social worker, all these things where you have to go through six hours of training a year, we actually provide that for them. So we're trying to get a lot of people aware of it. But um, yeah, the, the access to means is really important. And we actually um, were part of a coalition that passed a law a few years back that in Washington state, uh, if somebody is uh, in a suicidal state, uh, you can, and they have a, a firearm, you can get that out. You can give it to a, a neighbor, a, a family member, even if those people have no license for it, which mm -hmm. is actually kind of a big, it seems like a small thing, but it's actually a big thing because in a lot of states, you can't do that. And so people are very unwilling to say, oh, I can't, I can't take that out of the house. I'm going to break the law. So, right. you know, we do a lot of things, like I say, from the legislature down to, um, you know, just the nuts and bolts of, of people on the street. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things, so we, I talked a little bit about the youth focus and that's a, that's a really important part of it. We're also focusing a lot on veterans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, the, the actual population that has um, the highest rate of suicides is, is middle-aged white men. And there's a lot of those in uh, the world of veterans. Mm -hmm. And going back to that kind of Venn diagram, a lot of them have guns. And mm -hmm. so, um, we find that that's a really challenging population. They oftentimes become isolated. Um, so we're doing a lot of work around that. We've got actually two former Marines that do this work. And as you know, like I said, I came up in mentoring. There aren't a ton of, form of uh, former Marines that like talk about guns. <laughs> and, right, you know, right. they, they, they also work at the gun range as instructors. And so, but they're, you know, they're, they share the same thing, which is, uh, um, a genuine compassion for other people and, mm -hmm. and wanting to help their focus is just slightly different. So, you know, that's in a nutshell who we are. The, the, the work changes um, only because we constantly learn more, right? I think it's the same in any helping profession. Um, the answers don't stop, right? There's no, oh, this is it. Uh, because mm -hmm. life changes and we learn more. And so one of the great things about being at the University of Washington is we have access to all of that. You know, so we have a, an advisory council made up of, you know, I mean, everybody has 20 letters after their name, <laughs> you know, right. and they're just the smartest people you've ever met in your life. And, and, but they're doing this work. And so everything, when we have questions, we run it by them. When we're updating mm -hmm. things, we run it by them. And it's really, um, it's really a collegial and supportive uh, place. And so it's really exciting to be there because you really feel like we know what we're doing is making a difference. And you can yeah. imagine data and evaluation and all that stuff becomes a really key part of it too. So, you know, that's, that's what we do. Um, like I say, you know, we respond really, uh, we try not to say no. Mm -hmm. I mean, because look, <laughs> the work is too important to say, oh, I'm sorry, we can't do anything for you. And so, you know, one of our challenges is honestly, um, the demand for our service exceeds our ability to uh, supply it right now. And, right. you know, so we're, we're kind of looking at, I mean, we were talking about how partnerships, mm -hmm. right? How do we, how do we do more with less and scaling this work and by that i mean serving a significant percentage of a specific population right how do we scale this work up so more and more people have access to it more and more people know what to do more and more people feel comfortable at this going back we're all wrapping our arms around these young people not just if you're the parent or their teacher or even mm -hmm. just a mentor everybody's thinking about these things so we've got a couple of projects we work with ospi um for, for those of you that do school-based mentoring um we actually, so they have educational service districts, which are kind of their technical assistance providers. So in Washington state, we have 295 school districts and we have nine educational service districts that serve all of them. And um, the, each one of those has a health, uh, behavioral health navigator. And so we have a contract to provide technical assistance to them around suicide prevention. So we're developing toolkits, training them and so on so that Look, I mean, we're, we're 18 people. We can't serve 295 districts. It just can't happen. And so our model really is, what we talk about is incubating and scaling. So we kind of um, innovate programs that, have, you know, if there are areas that there isn't work being done, we try to fill that. We, we test it and say, boy, is this working? Kind of refine it. And if we're able to, then we, we try to hand it off to uh, a state agency or mm -hmm. a, a private sector funder who's then able to share it with everybody because we, we can't do that. And that's not our role. So 
Um, like I say, we, we do that with OSPI, the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs. We partner with our, our uh, veterans work. And, um, you know, we're always looking for how can we work with folks to get something out there. And we're really deliberate. You know, you, when we incubate things, it's kind of down low in the sense that until we're really sure this matters and, and we can actually make a difference and it's, you know, it's something that we can get out there, we don't really talk about it too much. Right. You, and we're always, there's always things in a stage. Some are in their infancy, some, mm -hmm. some are, you know, kind of right in the middle of it and some we're ready to launch. And so, um, you know, we we play a unique role in the suicide prevention ecosystem because we're halfway between the state and, you know, we're in the university, we're actually not a nonprofit, but we act like a nonprofit, you know, in a lot right. of ways we're, we're similar right. to the work you guys do and that it's kind of catalyst, right? And it's getting stuff out there and it's trying to bring people together in an organized way. And so, um, you know, it's no surprise because that is the mindset that I, I really inherited from, from the mentoring world. And I found that it's, you know, it's successful. If you're gonna do this stuff, you, you need that kind of organizing um, group just to bring everybody together. And like I said, it doesn't mean you're competing. It means you're complimenting one oh, another yeah. to make sense, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the collectivist approach uh, is exactly what we need right now, especially as we're coming, quote unquote, out of uh, COVID. Oh, I know, yeah, we're, we, we're talking about, you know, offering training through Mentor Washington to yeah. our providers, um, mm -hmm. the six hour training. So that, yeah. that will be forthcoming for sure. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, and, and so like I say, our work is really, you know, we try to work with folks. So mm -hmm. particularly nonprofits, I should say this, um, as, as those folks are thinking, boy, do they wanna, you know, get some help or anything. We, we have two models. So we provide a lot of um, training both to the state and to the private sector. And we have a set kind of fee schedule for that. And, but we also do a lot of, um, you know, community schools, nonprofits. And honestly, our driver there is, it's all mission. We got to get this stuff done. We also have a fee schedule, but we're much more flexible in how we do that, right? For our Forefront and Schools program, it's a three-year program. We don't charge anything. In fact, we we pay we bring schools out when we can when it's face to face. We right. bring them out to the campus twice a year. Uh, we pay for you know them to stay overnight. We actually end up paying for the substitute teachers at their at their school. So, you know, that's that's an example of kind of how we think about it. And I know everybody in this room is the same way, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's mission first, and you know, it it is a business in the sense that you got to keep the doors open and keep people being paid. But um, to the extent that we can, we will push that as far as we can to make sure that, you know, mission is always front and center in what we do. Yeah. And would, you, would, it, would it be uh, fair to say one of your goals is to be able to provide this training to more and more like mentoring organizations, for example, so that they will be able to support in suicide prevention um, and, and quote unquote intervention maybe. Yeah. That's right. No, I think that's exactly right. As, um, yeah. as we're thinking kind of, uh, how we move this forward, it's mm -hmm. increasingly, what are those high touch points, right? What are those groups still like OSPI? If we can if we can train the health navigators, mm -hmm. they can go train all 295 districts. And so like I was talking about postvention, right now we get calls from across the state, people wanting help. It, it's not sustainable. And, and a lot of times we're just scrambling because you can't plan for that. And so you're scrambling to say, who can, who can respond? Well, if we can train those health navigators, um, they can do it in their districts, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing with, with mentors. If we can, you know, at, at a kind of central node say, here, we're gonna train you guys. You guys go train your guys. You know, that's a train the trainer model where as you're training your mentors that come in, you just have a component where you train, you know, you train those folks. Um, that's to us exactly what we, we should be doing. I mean, and we think about it, you know, one of the things that we've recently done is uh, created a licensing agreement and, it, and not because it's about licensing and getting money. What it is, is that we want this information out there. It's not proprietary, right? It's not ours. We want you to use it. And what we want to, to make sure is we know who's using it because things change. And if we need a, an updated training, we want to know who you are and we want to tell you, hey, look, the, the, the deck that you use in your training 
it's been updated. So come on in. Um, we want to make sure that your trainers are up to snuff and know what they're doing. And, you know, every two years we retrain them and so on. So that's increasingly the path we're going down is that's in kind of catalytic role. How do we get this stuff and how do we get it in the hands of people that can move it forward? And, you know, it's not about it's not about us taking a bow. It's it's about you know making a difference in the lives of, of young people. And uh, honestly, I think mentoring, as much if not more than any other area, to me, is where you can do that directly. Um, by by you know training mentors, they become advocates and evangelists within that community about what needs to be done, right? They tell more and more people. They, other people get interested. They get involved. It's, it's um, you know, it's that brush fryer approach, right? Where you just go, and all of a sudden it spreads. And so, yeah, we're, we're excited about possibilities um, working with the mentoring community. We think that that's, um, you know, it's absolutely in line with, with what we want to accomplish. Well, yeah, I, lo I love that. We'll be definitely doing more of that. So we'll good, yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm wondering. You know, there's been studies that sh have shown that, uh, especially among teens, rates of depression have increased during this uh, pandemic. How yeah. how have the multiple pandemics been impacting your work at Forefront? You know, it's interesting. I it's funny. I just got a um, I did a radio interview with a. a program in, in Los Angeles and what and they said you know a CDC report came out and said that uh, youth suicide had not increased at the rates during the, the pandemic that people had thought it would be and you know, they wanted a, an answer to that and um, my answer was well that'd be fantastic right I mean like any nonprofit you want to put yourself out of business and that would be great right. but I don't think that's what the case is I think what you're seeing is a tale right where people like I said during COVID, people are experiencing isol just all those things, isolation, perceived burdensomeness, all these challenges, depression, anxiety. Um, those are things we know that are precursors to suicidal ideation, thinking you might wanna take your own lives. But it doesn't always happen right away, right? There, there's a, a buildup of those. So what I suspect is we're gonna see that come out mm -hmm. in the future. I think we're gonna start seeing this increasingly. Within, within the United States, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people, if you can imagine that. Um, and so unfortunately, I think we're gonna see that uh, going up and up um, unless we can do things to help. And so, you know, I think one of the things with, um, particularly around youth uh, and mentoring and suicide prevention is, you know, being young, the nature of it is it's high emotion. Uh, you know, you can be prone to, ups and downs, a, a sullen 15 year old, and I've, I've got a 15 year old, so <laughs> a, sullen, a sullen and moody 15 year old is kind of par for the course, right? And so, you know, a lot of it is, well, how do I recognize when this young person's like, you know, clinically depressed versus just being a young person, right? And, and, and those are part of the challenges. And those are, you know, what we try to do is, um, give people the tools to feel comfortable enough that they can say, hey, look, I, I think I need to come in here and, and ask a few questions and then, you know, move forward. But we expect, going to answer your question directly, I mean, we expect to see more and more of this. Anecdotally, we're responding um, to one-offs in a way we never have before. We just meaning like, I wanna get, we start a program every year. Um, we usually enroll about 50, schools a year I bet you we had 40 oh, wow. and three oh, dis wow. and three districts this year that wanted to be involved in it um, you know we're just not able to respond to that uh, we're actually looking to partner with some other organizations that might be able to do it but it's it's going right to your point everybody's just like oh this is going to be a tsunami when we all get back and so everybody's trying to get ready um, you know like I was saying hey I hope that's not the case I hope things are are mm -hmm you know, getting better. There's, you know, if we look at kind of the, the literature on it, there's no reason to think it would, but hey, thing, you know, we don't know everything. There might be a factor out there that we don't know. So yeah. um, we'll see, we'll see, but we're, we're trying to prepare for it. I mean, I will say this, the, um, the legislative session just ended. And as you can imagine, um, the state doesn't have a lot of money right now. Um, 
but among their priorities was youth mental health. And so they poured a lot of money into um, continuing this work. So, you know, we're gonna continue it because I think everybody's kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. So oh, yeah. who knows? I mean, maybe I'll come back in a year and we'll all celebrate and say, hey, look, wow, it really wasn't as bad as we thought, but we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah. Well, what, what should mentoring, you know, I know you have to run your own open up. For no, I actually time. don't. You know what, James, I had my wife take my, my son had oh, okay. to send to everybody. My son had to get his COVID. I thought I was going to, his vaccine, but no, I, she's taking him so I can stay. She's taking him. Great, great. <laughs> uh, so we have, a, you know, several youth providers on, on this call. What should they be thinking about as we head into summer and yeah. especially as we head back into the fall for school? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's this, right? It's that, uh, it's easy as adults, I think, to internalize the challenges that have come from COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also, you know, it, it, going back to it's starting to feel normal again, I think it's also easy, easier for adults to kind of look at it as a business as usual, right? Mm -hmm. This is just kind of, it, it's been challenging, but you know what, we're getting through it. And again, as adults, you've seen peaks and valleys and you know that if you're in a valley, there's a good chance there's gonna be a peak and we may be seeing this as a peak. Young people don't necessarily experience it that way, right? And even reopening things in and of itself, which seems positive, can be a great source of anxiety as people start to think, well, do I fit in? What's it, you know, it's always, it's interesting. Every, you know, every fall, no matter how old kids are, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm going back to school and they get nervous. Even though it's always, you know, 90% of the same kids are going to the same school, they still get nervous. Well, you can imagine, you know, this is one of the things we're, we're concerned about is that kind of throwing kids back into the mix um, is going to be challenging for some. So I think one of the things that uh, mentoring can always do is it, is it is that outlet, right? It is that other additional piece of somebody saying, hey, you okay? How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. You know, and and it doesn't, if you haven't been involved with it, it may not seem like a lot, but it's it can be everything. Mm -hmm. It is just, like I said, isolation is not good for anyone. And if you're a young person experiencing anxiety or depression, isolation is one of the worst things that can happen to you. It compounds other problems. So mentors, you know, I think especially school-based mentors over the summer, you know, there's always that challenge of if you're meeting, you know, I know lunch buddies, for instance, used to meet, uh, you know, during, I don't know, probably not doing it during COVID, but um, how do you maintain those relationships over the summertime and prepare the young people for that reentry is really, uh, I think, going to be critically important this summer more than other because there's a lot of uncertainty, but there is a tale of anxiety that's going to probably persist for years, frankly. There's also the thing of, gosh, you know, is it going to come back again? Could it be worse? All those types of things aren't going away. Right, and right. I think a mentor gives young people a way to talk about that, that they don't talk to their teachers. They might not talk to their parents or their friends. Um, and, you know, I, a lot of times a mentor is just listening, right? You don't have to have all the solutions to everything, but just letting, just like in suicide, when you ask somebody, are you thinking of killing yourself? It can be a huge cathartic release to say yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing here. Hey, are you, are you worried about going back to school? How do you feel? You know, you don't have to have the answer. You've just opened it up for them to kind of let the emotion out. And I think that that is incredibly important, that act. Mm -hmm. um, has an impact probably far more than I think a lot of people recognize. So I think it'd be, you know, letting those mentors know that this is really an important time for these young people. And your, your ongoing role and support is, is probably in some ways more important now than it has been in a long time, so. Yeah, I mean, that, that rings so true to me. We've, I've been doing some trainings around, uh, you know, locus of control, what you can control what you can influence yeah. and what is outside of your control. That kind of yeah. neuro, neuropathy, um, mm -hmm. is that something that is, is at the, no pun intended, at the forefront of forefront? <laughs> it, it is, right? <laughs> and you know, it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I always, I, I tell my kids this, but it's based in kind of the stuff that we do is, um, there are many things beyond your control. I mean, that that's life, right? If you try to subject life to this idea of what life is supposed to be, mm -hmm. there is always going to be a gap. And sometimes there is going to be a chasm 
between how you think life is supposed to be and how you think life is. And coming to terms with that, simply recognizing it um, is actually a powerful tool for folks. The other element that we, we talk about is, you know, I, I kind of reduce it to a, a, a slogan, which is don't let, your, don't let your mind play tricks on you. You can sometimes make something small into too big. Um, and, and that's because you can say, this is how life is supposed to be and my life is this way. And because I was slighted here or because I didn't get an A there or because I don't play the saxophone as well or whatever, right? Because I don't have the right shoes, that gap between where I'm supposed to be and, and where I am is just too great. And that, that leads to anxiety and depression and lots of other things. But to me, that's in some ways, um, your mind playing tricks on you in the sense that not, those exist because you create space for them to exist, right? You manifest that as that is a challenge. Now, even as an adult, that's something that's not easy to come to terms with. One of the things we do is, so when you get into our Forefront and Schools program, you know, three years worth of training, there's lots of things going on. One of the things that evidence shows, and we believe really strongly is, is dialectical behavioral therapy. And so for those that don't know DBT, it, it's kind of, it's mindfulness. I mean, really, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with mindfulness. And but that's what it is, and it's it's te it's teaching both um, caregivers, uh, teachers, parents, administrators, you know, uh, school nurses, what it means to help promote. But it's also teaching the kids themselves on how to do this, and it's just being reflective. I mean, it can be something as small as recognizing the language that you use when you speak to yourself. Right? Oh, I'm, gosh, I failed. That means I'm a loser. I, mm -hmm. I got a D on that test. That means I'm dumb. Right? All those kind of, that person didn't invite me to the party. I'm, I'm, I'm a loser. I'm not, I'm, pop, I'm not popular. That language is incredibly damaging, right? Because mm -hmm. that language compounds. And that's all part of that story in your head that you're telling yourself. But these aren't facts. These are your mm -hmm. interpretation of what other people are doing. And truthfully, whether they're right or wrong, doesn't matter. You, you're not in control of those things, right? And so you're creating challenges. And so dialectical behavioral therapy is one of the, um, our main tools that we try to give folks, but it takes a long time. I mean, the, the training, the initial training for this is like two days long. I mean, it's about 16 hours. And, um, you know, again, as part of our, our programming, it, it's super expensive. They're just, we're lucky enough that, um, two of the leaders in doing these trainings are the School of Education um, on the UW campus. And so uh, Jim and Liz Mazza, and if any of you are interested, they, they have a lot of books on it, but um, I think they, they charge like 2,000, 2,500 bucks per person to do this. Oh, but wow. <laughs> when you get in, we cover it for, for Forefront and Schools. And, and we can do that because we have a lot of private sector and public sector folks who believe in it. But it, it does speak to the impediment here, right? Is that that's one of the main tools that can make a difference. And that is not accessible to a lot of folks. So we're increasingly trying to say, well, how, you know, is there a light version? And, and that's actually the mindfulness is what we're working on, right? Now. It's recognizing it may not be the full, you know, 16 hour training with, you know, ongoing support, but just interjecting. I mean, you touched on it, James, right? I mean, if, if everybody can have that mindset, and just think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mentors aren't um, clinicians. I mean, they don't have to know the full DBT approach. But if they can just even recognize that that kind of the language thing, for instance, there's a couple yeah. things to just say. You could feel that's that's an easy thing to do is saying, oh well, tell me why. You know, why are you using that language? Boy, that seems pretty harsh. Is it always that way, or is it just sometimes that way? So. We're trying to work on that, um, but it is definitely uh, at the forefront of what we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. What, what I'm hearing is like talking about metacognition with a yeah. young person, right? That's right. That's it. And then, you know, non contingent reinforcement, you know? Yeah. Like sometimes, you, oftentimes, and this is because my background as an educator yeah. is often students that feel that way, I walk up and, you know, while they're just, writing their name on the top of their, their paper before COVID, hey, I appreciate you taking time to fill out this piece of paper. That's, That's it. Right. That's right. 
that goes so so far. Yeah. Well, you know, a, a lot of um, I, gosh, I, I think it was, um, I think it was a book on the Harlem Children's Zone. I don't remember yes. exactly where, but there, there was a stat that came out that just broke my heart, and it was something like, um, you know, young people that uh, display significant anxiety and depression versus young people that don't. One of the um, elements that's correlated with that is how many people give use positive words mm -hmm. when they speak with them. Mm -hmm. Hey, I appreciate that. Hey, that's great. Nice job. Good. Well, you're you're good at that, right? Small things again. And, and as mentors, we don't, you know, some, sometimes you don't see the impact you're making, right? But right. it's a cumulative thing, and it's down the road. For the 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 kids that got more of those were directly related to how they saw themselves and how they navigated the world versus kids that did not, you know, some of them were receiving 10 times as many. And literally they're positive words, mm -hmm. good, great, interesting, all these things, right? Versus those who just didn't get any. It, and it changed the trajectory and it's, it's only one factor and it's embedded in a lot of other things. But I think it's something that we can all understand. It resonates with us at a certain level, which is like, yeah, you know what? If I think in my own life, I'm 52 years old. Right. I like it right. when my 15 year old says, "Hey, nice job." I like it when my dog comes up to me like I'm important. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, all, yeah. we all like a little, little something positive. And yeah. for young people, it's even more so because they haven't developed that kind of, "Hey, this is this is me." And you know what? It's okay if somebody doesn't like that element of me. When you're young, you're still building that stuff. It's not easy. No, very, very hard. I want to open up to, to the audience, uh, yeah. but I, I appreciate all, all, the, all taking time to talk with us about, about this. And Yeah, you know, no, I appreciate this is a good conversation, James. I mean, yeah. obviously, you know, yeah. you speak in this stuff as well. Also, yeah. I appreciate the conversation, but yeah. yeah, I'm glad to answer any questions or, you know, anything I can from folks. Yeah. Does anyone uh, want to jump in and, and say, I can't see everyone's face but if uh you have a i mean question, you, you, you can give me your own observations too i mean i'm you know uh, i'm interested yeah. in how things work for you guys yeah thank you robin hi larry hi, hi robin how are you okay um i have a lot of questions i don't even know where to begin i i think <laughs> uh, uh i work with a lot of youth who have most of my mentees have uh experienced sexual violence and they're very young. Um, most of them are eight to or seven to 14. Um, and I'm just wondering about the, the incidence of uh, suicide or suicidal ideation with these youth. Yeah, you know, those are those risk factors that increase the likelihood, right? Um, childhood trauma, um, you know, as we all know, is connected to so many, it, you know, it becomes, uh, it's an immediate challenge to overcome, but then in a lot of ways, it can become an anchor that you're dragging for a long time. It doesn't mean you can't overcome it, but um, that is a, um, you know, a risk factor as we think about identifying the young people who may be at higher risk than others. One of the things we're increasingly doing, and this is actually a challenge for us, because right now our our you know what we call gatekeeper training, which is kind of helping other people recognize things and so on, by design it's a middle of the road training, right? It's it's just kind of throw everybody into a group, and and this works. But the truth of the matter is, as we all know, you know there are so many differences and you can slice it and dice it in a million different ways. And each one of those differences um, influence how people move through their lives. And so we're increasingly trying to figure out, you know, how do we provide training that is specific to unique populations? And then also what's the limit that we feel comfortable training a general public, right? I mean, and we always kind of come back to, I think, you know, gate keeper training really is about, um, it's that CPR. It doesn't mean you're a cardiac surgeon and you're gonna go and, it, but it means you're keeping somebody alive until somebody can come forward, right? And so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to help identify those things, but, you know, 
with a lot of things, you can do harm. I mean, the truth of the matter is you can if, you're not, if you don't know what you're going to do. And so this is a group that we're really, we're actually working on a new curriculum act for, for uh, childhood trauma because it's such a significant, when we go into the schools, it's one of those areas that you really have to spend special time with to understand because there is no one size fits all. So, you know, I think it's, it's kind of that standard mentoring challenge of, yeah, when, when um, you know, you're not a therapist, right? You're, you're one piece of the puzzle to support young people, but you know, that's, that's not your role. Ours is a little bit similar, but we're trying to take it a little bit more, but just to answer your question in general, those young people are at significantly higher risk um, of moving towards that path. Yeah, but, but you know, it doesn't mean they're going to. You, you, can, you can thwart that. You can change that trajectory if you get in front of it. You, even, with, even with, you know, childhood trauma, we do know that the likelihood of, of it not recurring if you can get somebody in front of it and stop it from progressing. I mean, one of the questions you ask everybody is, have you made a plan? And then you say, what is the plan? And people who have said, yeah, I went and I bought a gun or I've done, I've done this or whatever the case is, you know, that's a, that's a blinking red light. Young people don't always do that because they don't have the means. So it's a matter of interpreting, you know, what they're saying and how significantly that moves them down the path. And also knowing some young people aren't going, they're just not, they're either not able to kind of articulate it or they're unwilling to articulate it. So it, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, but I think that what you guys are doing is one of the few things right now that's a community-based, which is simply getting at, I'm sorry about that. I still have a landline, if you can imagine, um, is getting people out there, right? And, and doing our best to provide that bulwark. But that's right now one of our chief questions. How do we do this, right? How do we and there's so many different populations. I mean, we are working with um, members of the Skokomish tribe. So we're in Shelton and um, you know, most of the tribe is in Shelton schools. And so we said, well, how do we provide a really culturally relevant um, training for these folks? And um, geez, you know, we, so we did, but the truth is just because we did something for the Skokomish tribe doesn't mean it's relevant for the Nisqually tribe, does it, right? I mean, it, it's, it, they're just, it's kind of nonstop, right? So we got to pick something somewhere, and um, childhood trauma is probably the one that, that, frankly, is has the biggest impact. So that's that's one of the things we're incubating right now. And I think it's a real challenge too for us to, you know, it's kind of like what you said. Even with your training, the training that you offer, you know, two full days, that's still, you know, not totally. You know, you've been studying this probably for years. So, yeah. And it's like, as coordinators, you know, what what type of things we offer our mentors, you know, which are just bite-sized. Yeah. Really. Yeah, no, and you know, I think it's easy to kind of, I, I know in mentor, oh my goodness gracious. Um, hold on. You're very popular uh, know. today, Larry. <laughs> you know who it is? It's my parents. My parents live around the corner. <laughs> I guarantee you they want me to come over and do something and send it there. Um, so, but going to your point, um, Robin, you know, it, it is, um, I think in mentoring, because it is a light touch and you're working with young people that, you know, you can see could benefit from a deeper, you know, uh, engagement. It's tough to find that line. And I think you want to go deeper. But the truth is, ultimately, I think the strength is in um, lots and lots of people feeling comfortable and being supportive. You know, like James was saying, just a word makes a big difference. So I, I know we all want to go deeper into that work and really provide almost a, a, a clinician light role. There is a role for that. Maybe it's in schools, but I think, you know, for mentors, it is knowing that a word and just being there and letting them, letting the young person tell their story is huge. And, you know, that's the volume. I think it's all these things combined. I think of that pyramid. And to me, that base of that pyramid is community, the community support, feeling connected, having lots of people around there, having people feel comfortable to talk to young people. You know, you, 
you can't have the rest of it without that. So, you know, I think we need all those other elements, but you don't get them necessarily. You know, one thing I should say, because I know we're running out of time, but um, James can give you my email and anybody can contact me whenever they want. One of the roles that we play also is kind of a thought partner to your point, Robin, right? Sometimes you just, I don't even know, right? I don't even know what I don't know. Or, hey, do you know anybody that does this kind of work? Um, we, we play that thought partner information broker role too, so that, you know, you might want a training and we don't provide it, but we probably know somebody who does and, you know, we can make a recommendation and so on. So just know that you can always reach out, um, be glad to help in that regard. If, if we don't know, we'll tell you we don't know, but quite often we can find somebody who does. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks, Larry. We have about three minutes left. So I don't know if anyone has a, a question they'd like to pop off in the last couple of minutes. Um, let's see, Victoria just wrote in the chat. Um, it's good to see you. Thank you for sharing today. You brought up kids coming back to school in September. What are two or three most important reminders we can share with our mentors yeah. to help them help their mentees adjust? I, I would say, you know, again, it's that idea that I think we as adults are seeing this as, um, getting back to normal, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a dawn and it is in some ways, but for youth that doesn't necessarily mean they're seeing it in that same way. This, this may be actually provoking as much anxiety as the past has, both because you don't know what's coming in the future, but also that fear that, you know, things may shift back. So I think just being open to that and, and letting them know that it's easy to express opt oh, you must be really excited to do this. Oh, we're so great. With young people, that's sometimes hard because when you tell them that, they think, oh, well, I shouldn't say anything different. So I'd say giving, giving them the space to express any, you know, misgivings, uh, fear, anxiety or whatever about reopening and getting into school is going to be make a big difference. That's great. Yeah. I'm sh and I'm sure, it's, you know, in addition to youth, teachers are feeling the same way, right? Reentering the school building for the first time. Oh, having totally. to teach online and in person yeah. <laughs> concurrently. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, for all of us, right? For all, I think yes. the difference is, you know, for adults, we'll make the point and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. Give me, <laughs> give me some training. Let <laughs> me do this. Right. <laughs> you have a loud, loud family. I know, I got like a loud family. So, <laughs> anyways. Yeah. Well, appreciate, appreciate this conversation, Larry. Of course, I'll be reaching out to you soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, thanks so much. Again, I, I appreciate it. It's good to see some folks that I haven't seen for a long time. And uh, thank you guys for inviting me in. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, thanks, Vic, for putting to the chat, uh, both about the next Java with James, the conference happening next week. Hopefully, everyone's going to be attending. And then some uh, takeaway points from, from this conversation. Uh, this will be up on our website in the next week. Uh, have a lovely rest of your Thursday. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Have a good weekend. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. You're welcome.